Close your eyes and focus your attention on the breath. It's good to start with a couple of good, long, deep in and out breaths to make it very clear with the sensation of breathing in the body, because it's the breathing in the body that we'll be focusing on, not so much the air coming in and out through the nose, but the energy flow in the body that allows the air to come in and out. Notice where you sense it. And then notice if it's comfortable. If we're trying to bring the mind to the present moment. We have to make the present moment a pleasant place to be. So ask yourself what kind of breathing would feel good for you right now. You want it to be clear enough so you can keep it, keep your attention focused on it. Sometimes heavy breathing feels good, it's energizing. Other times you want something lighter. Longer, shorter, faster, slower, deeper, more shallow. Try to find what feels good right now. And then keep your attention focused. One of the ways of making the breath more comfortable is to make your attention steady and continuous. If there are gaps in your attention, the breath goes back to its old ways in the gaps, which may be okay and may not be so okay. for the breath and the body, but certainly not good for the mind, these gaps. It's a direct experience of ignorance, and you're off someplace else, not paying attention to what you're doing, and the mind just wanders around. We're trying to bring the mind under control. The word mind in Pali, citta can be translated both as mind and as heart into English. So we're trying to bring our heart into this as well, in other words, really wanting to do it, and having our reasons. The reasons are because we want happiness. If we want happiness, it doesn't harm anybody. That's a wise combination of your heart and your mind. Because you realize if your happiness depends on the suffering of others, they're not going to stand for it. A couple of passages in the canon, and it's interesting that the Buddha makes this point, sometimes talking to little children and sometimes talking to kings. Because both little children and kings tend to want to get things their way, without thinking too much about how it's going to affect other people. In other words, both of them have that part of the heart where the, the mind has not really taken control, or at least it's not part of the discussion. It's simply wanting, wanting, wanting what you want. I mean, the Buddha talks about this point with the kids. Uh, there was a case where some kids were tormenting a crab. You ask them, do you like pleasure and do you feel pain? And they say yes. Then why are you inflicting pain on others? Stop and think about it. Others, they like pleasure and they fear pain too. So when you think about that, you shouldn't, har shouldn't harm anybody. We tend to think if we love ourselves, and want our own happiness. That means we're setting in a collision course with other people, because they want their happiness oftentimes out of the same things that we want. But he says if you're really wise about your desire for happiness, realizing that other people are struggling to find their happiness too, you should have good will for them, just as you have good will for yourself. And that means at the very least not harming them or getting anybody else to harm them. Because if you did that, getting someone else to harm, they'd be harming two people, aside from yourself, both the person being harmed and also the person doing the harm. It would make an interesting point that if you really want to hurt yourself, you harm other people. And if you want to harm them, because you, you get them to do harm. In other words, the consequences of being a person who does harm to others is going to last for a long time. 
you hit somebody, the pain will go away after a while, but then the karma of having hit them may last for a long time. So that's the head part, just realizing the practicality that if your happiness depends on someone else's suffering, it's not going to last. And then there's the heart part. When you learn how to empathize with others, you see that we're all struggling to find happiness. And so many of us are causing ourselves suffering in the way we look for happiness. The Buddha saw this and he felt a sense of compassion. The image he had before he went out into the forest was that the world was like a little stream. And there were lots of fish in the stream fighting one another over the water, each wanting its space in the water and pushing the others out. Of course, Everybody's going to die in the end. You realize that you look around in the world for happiness, and you're not going to find anything that someone else is not also going to lay claim to. But, he said, that doesn't mean you give up your search for happiness. You look inside, and you realize the problem lies inside. If you can find the sources for happiness inside, you can solve the problem that is inside. So thinking in these ways can give rise to a, a heart state of compassion, where you empathize with the sufferings of all, of all beings. You look around, everybody is suffering. Even people who are wealthy, powerful, they're suffering. Devas up in the heavens are suffering, to say nothing of the ordinary sufferings, the things we ordinarily count as suffering all around us. So this follows a pattern where the Buddha teaches mindfulness. He says you look at your own mind and your own heart your own body, and you realize that other people have the same experiences. You have pain in your body, other people have pains in theirs. You have suffering in your own mind, other people are suffering too. You realize that you're causing your suffering by your own lack of knowledge. You think about the other people who are doing a lot of harm in the world. Well, it's from their own lack of knowledge, their own lack of understanding. So when you think in these ways, it's a lot easier to give rise to a mind of goodwill for everybody. May all beings, or wouldn't it be good if all beings could find happiness? Now, we don't expect that everybody's going to find happiness. Someone once asked the Buddha if everybody was going to gain awakening, and the Buddha didn't answer. They said, half the world, a third of the world, and the Buddha didn't answer. Ananda was concerned that the person asking the question might go away dissatisfied. By here he was asking an important question, and the Buddha didn't answer. So he pulled the person aside. He said, it's like a large fortress, and the fortress has a wise gatekeeper. He walks around the fortress, and he, aside from the, the one gate, he doesn't see any opening in the fortress wall, even big enough for a cat to slip through. So he comes to the conclusion that he doesn't know how many people are going to come in and out of the for fortress, but he does know that if they're going to go into the fortress, they have to go in by the gate, any large animals. And it's the same way with the practice. Not everybody's going to gain awakening. The Buddha's knowledge is such that if anyone is going to gain awakening, it's going to be through following the path. But how many people are going to follow that? Even he didn't pay attention to that question. So we can't really expect that everybody is going to be happy. But we want to make sure that our actions with regard to everyone are an expression of goodwill, and it would be in line with that wish that everybody be happy. Because as we go through the world, we're going to meet a lot of really disagreeable people. People who are cruel, people who are harsh, people who are very selfish, who can think only about their own sufferings and don't care about the sufferings of others. But we can't have that attitude. Our attitude, if we're going to be wise, if we really do want to be happy, is that we're not going to do anything to harm them. 
And if there's any way we can help to find them or show them the way to true happiness, we're happy to do it. So I try to create a sense of ease inside. So it's a lot easier to think these thoughts when you're miserable and hungry and in pain. Sometimes there's a mind state, as long as I'm suffering, maybe everybody else should. That's the wrong way to think. The Buddha set a good example. One time he was attacked. Someone wanted to kill him. They rolled a stone down the mountain, while well, the stone hit another rock and split into splinters. So it didn't hit the Buddha except for one large sliver of one of the stones. Pierced his foot. So I had to lie down and rest. Mara comes up and accuses him of being moping around and being miserable. And the Buddha says, I'm not miserable. I'm spreading thoughts of goodwill to all beings. And that's a good example to take. You look at your own sufferings, and instead of just making your sufferings fill the world and be the only thing that you're interested in, you think about the fact that other people are suffering too. And that takes away some of the singularity of your own suffering. It make, puts it into perspective. Because if you think everybody else is happy and you're miserable, your suffering just fills your heart. But if you can enlarge your heart to see that, okay, everybody else out there is suffering too, there are many, many people suffering, may they all stop suffering, it takes you away from your own, your own misery. It puts everything into, into perspective so that the suffering is a lot easier to take. Of course, the Buddha did have the skills of his meditation to help as well so that the pain in his foot was not the only sensation he had to focus on in his body. He could focus on the, the well-being of being with his breath. So learning how to create this sense of well-being is not a selfish pursuit of happiness. Some people think that Buddhism is narrow and selfish and that each person is looking out only for himself, but that's not the case. If you can find a good, solid happiness inside, that means you're not irritated, you're not frustrated in your search for happiness. People who are irritated and frustrated tend to take that irritation and frustration out on other people. But here you have happiness inside. And so you take that out, and you can take that out on other people, but you take and offer it to other people too. Your thoughts, your words, and deeds come from a sense of well-being inside. And those are not afflictive either to you or to the others. So do what you can to create this sense of well-being as you relate to the body. As the Buddha says, once there's a sense of well-being with the breath, you can think of that spreading to fill the whole body. Think of breath channels going through the body, down through the nerves, down through the blood vessels. That comfortable breath saturates the whole body into every cell, out to every pore. That way you find a harmless happiness inside, which means you're less likely to lean on other people, less likely to harm them in any way at all. So you find that your heart and your mind are working together. Your heart wants happiness, and your mind has figured out this is the best place to find it. So keep your attention focused here, because if you solve the problem here, nothing else is a problem for the mind.